Hello, this is BCIT School of Business Marketing Program 3342 Negotiation Skills, and I'm your instructor, Debbie Palmer. Today, we're going to summarize Chapter 10 in our Essentials of Negotiation Workbook. Chapter 10 is entitled Confronting the Dark Side, Deception and Ethical Dilemmas. Our learning objectives for Chapter 10. After reading this chapter, you should be able to explain what ethics are and why they apply to negotiation. List the questions of ethical conduct that are likely to arise in negotiation. Explain what motivates unethical behavior and identify the consequences. And lastly, describe how negotiators can deal with the other party's use of deception. Learning objective one, what do we mean by ethics and why do they matter in negotiation? First, let's define ethics. Ethics are broadly applied social standards for what is right or wrong in a particular situation or a process for setting those standards. Ethics grow out of particular philosophies which purport to, first of all, define the nature of the world in which we live, and secondly, prescribe rules for living together. An ethical dilemma exists for a negotiator when possible actions or strategies put the negotiator's potential economic benefits or other non-economic benefits of doing a deal in conflict with the negotiator's social obligations to other involved parties or the broader community. Four standards for evaluating strategies. Number one, Choose a course of action on the basis of results I expect to achieve. Number two, choose a course of action on the basis of my duty to uphold appropriate rules and principles. Number three, choose a course of action on the basis of societal norms, values, and strategy of my organization or community. And number four, choose a course of action on the basis of my personal convictions. Applying ethical reasoning to negotiation. There are four different approaches to ethical reasoning. Number one, end result ethics. That is doing whatever is necessary to get the best possible outcome. Number two, duty ethics. Acting on certain obligations to direct conflict. Number three, social contract ethics. The rightness of an action is based on the customs and norms of a particular society or community. And number four, personalistic ethics. The rightness of the action is based on one's own conscience and moral standards. The approach to ethical reasoning you favor affects the kind of ethical judgment you make and the consequence behavior you choose. And here's our second learning objective. So what questions of ethical conduct arise in negotiation? Firstly, ethically ambitious tactics, which is mostly all about the truth. Ethically ambis ambiguous tactics that may or may not be improper depending on an individual's ethical reasoning and circumstances. Next, the attention here is on what negotiators say or what they say they will do than on what they actually do. And arriving at a clear, precise, effective negotiated agreement depends on the willingness of the parties to share accurate information about their own preferences, priorities, and interests. At the same time, negotiators seek maximum self-interest and may not disclose certain information. This gives rise to the fundamental negotiator's dilemma involving trust and honesty. Sustaining the bargaining relationship means choosing a middle course between the complete openness and complete deception. And deception in negotiation can rise to the level of legally actionable fraud. Next, identifying ethically amb ambiguous tactics and attitudes towards their use. What ethically ambiguous tactics are there? Of the six categories to uh, use of traditional competitive bargaining tactics and emotional manipulation, 
are viewed as generally appropriate and likely to be used. These tactics, while mildly inappropriate, are nevertheless seen as appropriate and effective in successful distributed bargaining. The other four categories of tactics are generally seen as inappropriate and unethical in negotiation. And these four are misrepresentation, misrepresentation to opponent's network, inappropriate information gathering, and lastly, bluffing. So is it right to use ethically ambiguous tactics? The studies summarized here indicate that there are tactically agreed on rules of the game in negotiation. In these rules, some minor forms of untruth, misrepresentation of one's true position to the other party, bluffs and emotional manipulations may be seen as ethically acceptable and within the rules. Outright deception and falsification are generally seen as outside the rules. And our third question is the deception of a mission versus commission. The use of deceptive tactics can be passive or active. There are two forms of deception. First, misrepre misrepresentation by omission, which is failing to disclose information that would benefit the other, and misrepresentation by commission actually lying about the common value issue. Studies indicate people are more willing to lie by omission. This reinforces the norm of caveat emptor, in other words, buyer beware, and the onus on the negotiating parties to ask pertinent questions to probe for any potential deception by omission. So why use deceptive tactics? This is our learning objective three. And we'll look at motives, and consequences. First, the power motive. In the exchange of facts, arguments, and logic, it's assumed that the information is accurate and truthful. Any inaccurate and untruthful statements introduced into this social exchange manipulate information in favor of the introducer. Through the tactics such as bluffing, falsification, misrepresentation, deception, and selective disorder, the liar gains advantage. Other factors leading to unethical behavior. Situational factors can drive unethical behavior. For example, uh, a salesperson pushed to meet a quota as a year end approaches, as can personal characteristics. Research shows the following factors led to unethical behavior. First of all, an organization's ethical standards of behavior are more ambiguous. Next, a person is concerned more with their present circumstances than what their circumstances are likely to be in the future. Next, a negotiator perceives their current situation as a loss frame rather than a gain frame. And you can see the discussion on framing effects in chapter six. Next, uh, negotiators experience anxiety and deception is lower when they experience optimism. And next, incentives are high. And, and lastly, a negotiator's disposition has a high level of moral disengagement, meaning they find it easier to justify morally ambiguous choices. Two more reasons for the use of deceptive tactics. The next one is consequences can be negative or positive. A negotiator who employs an unethical tactic will experience positive or negative consequences based on three aspects of the situation. First is effectiveness. Consequences will occur depending on whether the tactic worked or not. That is, whether the negotiator got what he or she wanted as a result of using the tactics. Frequency of unethical conduct is likely to increase because the negotiator believes that they can get away with it. The next is reactions of others. A second set of consequences may arise from judgments by the person who is the target of the tactic, by constituencies or by audiences that observe the tactic. The use of an unethical tactic may create short-term success for the negotiator and or an advisory who bent 
who are bent on revenge and retribution. Thirdly, reactions of self. Another set of consequences may result depending on how the negotiator evaluates, evaluates his or her own use of the tactic. Whether you, they're using the tactic, pardon me, whether using the tactic creates any discomfort, stress, guilt, or remorse, or in contract, whether the actor sees no problem in using the tactic again, and even begins to consider how to use it more effectively. Our last reason for using deceptive tactics is explanations and justifications. There is an increasing steam, stream of research on those who employ unethical tactics and the explanations and justifications they use to rationalize them. There's these uh, examples. Here are some examples. First, the tactic was unavoidable, the tactic was harmless, or they were going to do it anyway, so I did it first. Our last learning objective for Chapter 10 is how can negotiators deal with the other party's use of deception? Research evidence indicates that liars are not easy to spot. However, if you think the other party is using deceptive tactics, then take steps to do the following. First, ask probing questions. Research shows that most buyers fail to ask questions and that asking questions can reveal a great deal of information, some of which the negotiator may intentionally leave undisclosed. Ask yes or no questions that specifically address the issue. The second way is use contingency contracts. Have you ever been involved in a negotiation where you were skeptical of your counterpart's ability to meet the terms and conditions of your agreement? One way to satisfy your skepticism is by using a contingency contract, an agreement that satisfies negotiator interest by taking into account negotiators' differences concerning future events. The third is force the other party to lie or back off. If you suspect the other party is being cagey or deceptive about an issue, but is not making a clear statement in plain language, Pose a question that forces him or her to tell a direct lie. Of course, if the assertion is false, or else abandon or qualify the assertion. Ask a question in a clear way that calls for a yes or no answer. Some people are comfortable being misleading, but they will run headlong into their conscience if forced to flatly lie while looking someone in the eye. Next, call the tactic. Indicate to the other side that you know he is bluffing or lying. Do so tactfully, but firmly, and indicate your displeasure. Next, discuss what you see and offer to help the other party change to, be, to uh, more honest behaviors. This uh, is a variation on calling the tactic but it tries to assure the other party that telling the truth is, in the long term, more likely to get him what he, or her what they want than it is than any form of bluffing or deception will. Lastly, respond in kind. We do not recommend this course of action at all because it simply escalates the destructive behavior and drags you into the mud with the other party. But if they recognize that you are lying too, that person may also realize that the tactic is unlikely to work. So how do you handle your own temptation to use deception? Avoid the temptation to use deception in negotiation with the following tips. First, consider the retribution costs. This can be risk of losing the deal or loss of faith can also cause significant damage. Next, Prepare to answer difficult questions. Someone who is caught off guard and faced with a tough question experiences a tougher temptation to answer with a lie. Those who consider this in their preparation plan are much less likely to have to make quick decisions than to get them in trouble. Or pardon me, that will get them in trouble. 
Next, as, and as soon as a lie is told, from that point on, the rest of your story has to be structured to fit with that lie. Another way to avoid your temptation for deception is to refuse to answer certain questions. Answers such as the following may help. For example, this is a discussion we can have later on, once we have both committed to the deal. I don't feel comfortable divulging that information at this time. Or, as you can undoubtedly understand, we cannot share that information for strategic reasons. Another example might be, the answer to your question depends on many factors that we need to, to discuss. Let's close up this summary with some key points. To close, we suggest that negotiators who are considering the use of deceptive tactics ask themselves the following questions. Will they really enhance my power and help me achieve the objective? How will the use of these tactics affect the quality of my relationship with the party in the future? And how will the use of these tactics affect my reputation as a negotiator? Negotiators frequently overlook the fact that although unethical or expedient tactics may get them what they want in the short run, these same tactics typically tarnish reputations and diminish effectiveness in the long run. That's our summary for chapter 10. And as usual, you have five days to submit your assignment. Go ahead and, and work on your assignment and good luck with that. Uh, once you've opened the assignment, you have 45 minutes to complete. So good luck with your assignment and I hope you've enjoyed chapter 10.